Hey everyone, welcome to this edition of Live Chat with me, Brian Barron, Paula's Choice Skincare Director of Research. It is Thursday, April 29th, and this is the first uh, date that we are going back to a bi-weekly schedule. So every other week, I will be doing these chats with you for a full hour, and each one is going to have well, at least that's the plan going forward. Each one is going to have a dedicated topic. Today's topic is fine lines and wrinkles. So I'll be talking all about that. Difference between them, why they form, um, multiple factors why they form, um, the type of lines and wrinkles you can do something about and the type that you can't, uh, where skincare stops and cosmetic corrective procedures can uh take you the rest of the way there, so to speak. Um, so yeah, that's, I just tell me what is on your mind. We can talk anything skincare or beauty related. So chime in with whatever, but uh, I will be specifically looking for questions that relate to the topic, at least for the um, first go around with questions. Um, I made some notes here. What else do I have to say? I've got my bubbly going. Um, let's see, how's everybody been doing? It's just still such a I'm feeling more optimistic. It's still a very strange time. Um, you know, it's in um, Michigan as of this week. The um, uh, Governor Whitmer's orders, um, it is now a requirement as opposed to a recommendation that you wear a face mask when you are out. Um, how, how is it How is it defined? It's, it's um, like if you go, if you go to a store, let's just say. So Pretty much the only store I've been going to um, with any regularity during this time is the grocery store, um, occasionally the drugstore, depending on what the grocery store doesn't have. Um, but now it's you know, mandatory that you wear a mask, and um, my husband is quite good with the sewing machine, uh, and we actually had uh, a decent amount of fabric left over as well as some. we took... We took elastics off of our son's uh, superhero masks that he doesn't play with anymore. And we asked him, we were like, hey, we're going to use this and do you care? And he's like, no, go ahead. Um, so we have these homemade masks that um, one of mine has uh, took a lot of extra sewing, but it has a <clears throat> pipe cleaner um, in, uh, tucked into the portion and it's all sewn in, but you can adjust the pipe cleaner over your nose um, for a better fit, more of a secure fit. Um, I have mixed feelings. Uh, I have a mixed feelings about wearing masks. Um, I think I'm, I'm not, I'm not being a conspiracy theorist, uh, about this at all, but I just, I have a strong feeling that we will find out in due time that this virus is much more widespread, um, than originally thought that a lot more people have been exposed to it, um, than originally thought. I, and, um, so at this point, there's a little bit of, I, I'm going along with it. I'm wearing a face mask, but it almost feels like, um, it, it almost, it almost feels like putting on a condom after the deed and hoping that <laughs> you don't get anything or get somebody pregnant. It's just like, really? I kind of think most of us have been exposed to this already, but I completely acknowledge also that there are vulnerable, more, much more vulnerable people than myself in our population, that wearing a face mask isn't necessarily about protecting yourself as much as it is about protecting other people. And yes, it is um, a bit scary that um, there are so many, um, the, they still haven't settled on a firm statistic on just how many people who've had COVID-19 are asymptomatic. Um, I've seen anything from 20, 25% upwards of 50%, uh, which is kind of freaky. But, you can't, there aren't too many viruses that are well known that you can just go around without symptoms, but still infect other people. Now, granted, people who are showing symptoms can uh, have a much greater likelihood because their viral load is believed to be higher. So there's a much greater likelihood that they can transmit the virus to others more readily. Um, it's just, it's, it's been fascinating to watch the research uh, and on this unfold and, and what we've learned in a very short period of time and incredibly um, affirming to see how many 
um, medical and educational institutions are working overtime to figure this out, how we can either um, cure it, potentially, uh, or at the very least come up with a vaccine that allows us to uh, minimize fatalities, minimize the strain in the medical system, and basically just get back to life before this all happened. And it's just still so shocking how it happened all over the world. But we're here to talk about fine lines and wrinkles. So what, let me go over the list of the primary causes of fine lines and wrinkles. Um, fine lines you can kind of look at, there isn't necessarily a textbook definition for a fine line. It's one of those, we, uh, we, you know it when you see one. Um, they typically tend to show up first around the eyes. What a shock, skin is thinner there. There's no next to no sebaceous glands. And this area uh, engages in thousands of micro contractions a day. It's this, the skin around the eyes is, is in uh, a lot of, there's a lot of motion going on there. Even if you're not even aware that the skin is moving, it is, you know, when you do this, when you open your eyes wider, when you blink, I mean, there's just always in motion. Um, there is, there are schools of thought that a fine line can be characterized as a precursor to a wrinkle. It's a young wrinkle. This, you know, it makes sense. You start seeing fine lines in your 20s, typically mid 20s, sometimes not until your early 30s if you've been really good about sunscreen uh, during that decade. Um, where was I going with that thought? Did I lose it? I think I just lost my train of thought. Most people would say there's nothing too fine about any type of line, um, but there are, so there are the fine lines that are essentially the precursor to a fully formed wrinkle that has to do with cumulative sun damage. And then there can also be fine lines that are the result of um, your skin being dehydrated or just on the drier side. Uh, and you'll, if, if that is the type of fine line you're dealing with, uh, you'll you'll know because as soon as you put anything hydrating on there, whether it's a serum or a moisturizer or some sort of a treatment product, the fine line will look much better, potentially even uh, becoming invisible. You know, it's, and then you wash your face; it doesn't go away permanently, but you wash your face, and that fine line is going to start to come back uh, again, more prominent in areas where you are dry, less prominent in areas where you have more more oil glands. Um, I rarely hear people complain about having fine lines on their forehead, for example, but definitely around the eyes. More sebaceous glands up here, next to no sebaceous glands in this area. So um, the one thing to know though in terms of wrinkle formation is that what causes a wrinkle to form is a complex series of events. It isn't just one thing. It's not just too many days out in the sun, too much time at the tanning parlor, too many uh, years of smoking. It, it's multifactorial. Smoking actually being one lifestyle choice that has been shown um, in numerous studies to promote wrinkles and what's called um, elastosis, where the um, elastin fibers in the lower layer of skin actually start to become uh, disorganized, they, um, they're not as, they lose their tensile strength, their ability to bounce back. Um, and that sets the stage from the dermis layer, the lower layer uh, up for that wrinkle that essentially that's, that's another um, factor in this process is that things like sun damage, smoking, poor diet, even certain skin conditions, to some extent a genetic tendency uh, that impacts when your skin support system starts going, uh, starts breaking down, there are, there are um, the without question sun exposure, pollution exposure, which would include uh, cigarette or tobacco smoke and even vaping smoke, uh, can cause those um, protein, those fibrous protein uh, support systems in your skin to start deteriorating and at, at a much sooner rate. Then there is the intrinsic aging side of it, which is simply the mere passage of time. Just getting older, you know, more candles on your birthday cake. Um, as human beings, our cells are programmed to only divide a certain number of times. As that cellular division starts to slow down, we start showing more signs of deteriorating, whether it's our skin, which is the body's largest organ, or other organs like our liver, our heart, our digestive system, 
things just start going or at least have a greater tendency to go wrong and not work as efficiently the more you age. Um, but of course, there's, there's the chronologic aging that uh, you know most people want to enjoy a long, full life and be as active and as happy and healthy as they can for as long as possible. Um, and then there's the um, extrinsic aging that complicates things because it, it has this interplay with what is going to happen naturally to you because of your genetics and there's really nothing you can do about it. So there's that whole aspect of wrinkles from intrinsic aging that's really not within your control. Um, you can use skincare and various procedures, of course, to visibly take care of the effects of that, but it isn't going to stop that natural progression. And then there's the extrinsic aging, which is anything that hits you from the outside. So um, Paula likes to describe it as exposome factors, which is actually how it's described in the research. And that is the sum total of what you have been exposed to since coming into this world. And then a lot of that, as it turns out, uh, hits our skin and causes uh, a deterioration, uh, unless we're taking steps to uh, slow that down or stop it entirely. Skin color matters when it comes to wrinkles. Um, if you have a lighter skin tone, meaning less melanin, uh, because having more melanin gives you more uh, natural protection in the presence of UV light, you have a greater uh, timeline before you will start to see wrinkles. That is why a Caucasian woman uh, in her 30s, for example, may be seeing um, fairly etched wrinkles around her eyes, maybe around her mouth and on her forehead, uh, but an African-American woman at the same age uh, is, isn't seeing nearly that much. Uh, or um, if, if she's seeing lines at all, they're, they're much more superficial. Um, they're, they're may, or maybe they're just expression lines, uh, which are also called um, dynamic wrinkles. So skin color matters, but not as much as you might think. It, just because you have more melanin in your skin, uh, regardless of your, your ethnic background, that melanin is not a bulletproof shield. That melanin is not, uh, it does not give you carte blanche to go out into the sun, to tan, to just accumulate all this environmental damage because, hey, that melanin is going to take care of it. Eventually, your skin will start suffering the effects of too much environmental exposure. One of the things um, that it can be particularly more noticeable in darker skin tones is the uh, cumulative UV light exposure damages the mag and this is true for everybody but that can be more visible in darker skin tones but it damages um, the mechanisms that skin cells use to turn over to shed normally and so on a darker skin tone you may see that as a buildup of grayish ashen looking skin uh, that whereas that type of a buildup isn't as readily uh, apparent the lighter your skin is I wouldn't see it as much. It's not that it isn't happening, but that can also be a telltale sign if you have a darker skin tone that even if you're not seeing fine lines and wrinkles yet, your skin is still being hammered by that constant, or not constant, but daily unprotected exposure to UV light, to pollution, to those exposome factors that age us. The um, uh, more, this is more for women than men, uh, but midlife changes, uh, that, that drop in estrogen that women experience as they go through menopause. Uh, studies have shown that uh, in the first five years of active menopause, women can lose up to upwards of 30% of their supply of collagen. Now, men lose collagen too as, as we age and as our hormone levels shift over time. But because the drop in estrogen for women as they go through menopause is more precipitous, it happens faster and at a greater rate, men's uh, testosterone decline uh, and then the estrogen coming up a bit, that tends to be a bit more gradual. So studies have shown that in terms of men and wrinkling, men tend to lose collagen uh, at a slower rate than women do. But believe me, we've got our own problems in other respects. So. <laughs> Um, but there, and this can be a topic for another show, but there are, we should do a show about menopause and the skin. Um, there are things that you can do to trick your skin into thinking that it still has a normal amount of collagen. And that's, that's, that's exciting. But what's important is being aware of that, uh, as a factor in fine lines and wrinkles. You've got your expression lines, 
you, you know, we all know people and have people in our lives that are more animated. Their foreheads are always moving. Uh, they have the, that, that kind of crinkly smile, you know, which, and is very endearing. Um, over that, that is wrinkles that form in the spaces between where the muscle contracts. So you've got this whole musculature in your face underneath the skin. And as you do things like smile, frown, um, you know, open your eyes wide, squint, move your forehead, get, you know, scrunch up like this and you're getting those 11 lines uh, or the bunny lines as they're sometimes called between the brows. The um, nasolabial folds can develop uh, their own issues with um, expression lines. That is less likely, um, there, there's an expression line component to that part of the face, but when these start really getting more deep, it's almost always about fat pads shifting beneath the skin and the subcutaneous layer of fat, which is if you're looking at a cross section of skin, um, you've got your your um, your uh, stratum corneum, the outermost layers, then you know that, and then the, those that's one of the layers of the epidermis. You're going further down. You've got the dermal epidermal junction, which is the layer that separates the epidermis from the dermis, and then ben below the dermis, which is where uh, collagen is formed, uh, you have a layer of subcutaneous fat. And that is responsible for giving uh, the face much, much of its youthful shape, fullness, plumpness. Um, it is one of the reasons that um, facial exercises largely don't work to stop signs of aging or stop wrinkles because they do nothing to address the subcutaneous fat. You can build up those muscles more, yes, just like you can build up muscles anywhere on the body, but just by building up that muscle, it doesn't... It, depending on the level of environmental damage you've had, that muscle isn't going to always take everything else with it, if that makes sense. There's gonna be certain subsections of skin that are just gonna stay where they are and that ultimately isn't going to make you look younger. Plus, if you think about it, especially for expression lines, the reason that um, injectables like Botox and Dysport work so well is that they actually cause, they prevent the muscle from moving. They prevent that muscle from contracting. When you stop the contraction, you stop the wrinkle when it's an expression line. Uh, the, other, the other factor that is important to consider, and I don't, it, this, this can be surprising for a lot of people, is that daily use of products that contain irritating ingredients, very drying ingredients, and we're talking facial care, so products, toners with high amounts of alcohol, products with a lot of fragrant oils, uh, any of those ingredients that can irritate skin, that cumulative effect of the irritation, and it can be occurring silently beneath your surface. Um, we always comment that was one of the most fascinating aspects of research when we were looking at irritation in skin years ago, is that skin can be very good at hiding when it's being irritated. So if you're one of those people who are using a product or several products with a lot of fragrance and other known irritating ingredients and you're thinking to yourself, well, I really like these products and I'm not seeing any irritation. Um, so I, they must be fine for me or I have hardy skin or whatever the justification is. The, the surprising aspect is that that inflammation, that low level inflammation can be occurring beneath the surface of the skin and it won't manifest itself for years later. It's very similar to cumulative sun damage. You know, if you're being exposed to UV light every day or tanning uh, indoors or out, you don't necessarily, you don't feel that damage taking place. You're not feeling or seeing that collagen and elastin breaking down in real time. Uh, your body is working fast and furious to try to offset and repair that damage. And eventually those repair systems start becoming faulty. They're unable because of the cumulative damage, they're unable to keep up. They, they just, they can't do it. Um, so the system starts breaking down. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, oh, this was interesting. There are some studies, including a relatively recent one, that um, does indicate, I did not purchase this study, so there's more details to be found here, but just I made some notes from the detailed abstract um, is that sebum, our skin's oil, seems to make a difference in wrinkle depth and the we Well, we know it makes a difference in the perception of wrinkles. If you look at somebody 
two people that have roughly the same amount of environmental damage. They're both uh, showing wrinkles. The person who has naturally oily skin is going, their, their lines and wrinkles are not going to be as apparent as the person that has dry skin. And part of the reason for that seems to be that sebum in our skin has an impact on how deep a wrinkle can get. Again, I didn't read all of the, the details and I'm not even sure if the study would reveal this, but what I suspect is going on is that because our skin sebum is a rich source of protective antioxidants, including uh, the emollient squalane, that to a certain degree, even though the sebum can start oxidizing in the presence of UV light, that antioxidant capacity in the sebum may be preventing some amount of deeper damage from taking place. And that is the anatomy of a deeper wrinkle, is that it's a sign that deeper damage has taken place. It's a sign that collagen and elastin have become fragmented or stretched. Uh, the underlying support structure just isn't there in that area, so you end up with more of an etched deep, more, and sometimes, depending on the extent of the damage, you can even take on a cross-hatched pattern. Um, that is typically uh, a result of what's called solar elastosis. That um, is essentially a process that's almost exclusively caused by unprotected cumulative sun exposure. Shocker. Um, but what happens is that that damage causes an increase in the activity of an elastin degrading enzyme. I believe its name is elastase. And that progressively weakens the elastin. If you think of elastin like a rubber band, and then you think you're holding a regular rubber band in your hand, how many times can you stretch it to its capacity before it snaps? And then you could tape that rubber band together or staple it or glue it or whatever. It's never gonna go back to the original tensile strength it had when it was new. Um, you wanna hold on to and protect as much of your young, healthy elastin as you can, because unlike collagen, our skin pretty much makes a finite amount of elastin. It doesn't, there, there are systems in place to help skin generate new elastin and to some extent repair it. But, and even when products say that they help generate elastin, when you look at the results histologically, the elastin that is generated is typically what's called tropoelastin, which is very young elastin. It doesn't have all the same properties as the kind of elastin that you want and that we grow into from childhood through adulthood. So that's kind of fascinating. You can show an ingredient, a product, whatever, um, stimulated elastin. There's new elastin being created, but if it never gets beyond that young phase, it really doesn't quite know where to go. And so it really can't become a part of the a natural part of the skin's existing elastin structure and health. So all of that can contribute um, to, to wrinkles. Uh, another thing that isn't often talked about because it gets a bit more technical is that that layer between the, the epidermis and dermis, which is called the DEJ or the dermal epidermal junction, uh, that flattens with, uh, again, cumulative environmental damage and to some extent just natural aging, but that dermal epidermal junction flattens and then the layer of subcutaneous fat beneath that starts to atrophy. It just, it kind of just starts to do this. Uh, it can't stay like this the way we want it to. Um, there's also a, uh, what's known as a proteoglycan called decorin. And a proteoglycan is uh, a protein. Collagen's a protein, elastin's a protein. Proteoglycan is a protein that is bonded to what's called a glycose aminoglycan. That is um, a very important substance in skin's dermal layer that gives skin a lot of its youthful vitality. And this decorin protein actually helps do what's called decorate collagen. And kind of a weird name to describe the process, but what decorin naturally does in skin is it helps tell the collagen where to go, how to lay, how to organize, uh, so that you get that nice smooth mesh effect, um, you know, those nice smooth tight collagen bundles. If you look at young healthy collagen under a microscope, it's very tightly packed, very nicely organized, and then if you have a chance to look at, uh, and you could find like pictures of this online, you don't have to actually go into a lab, but if you look at um, damaged collagen, 
uh, and you will see that the difference can be striking depending on how much damage has happened. It's fragmented, it's still there, but it just isn't holding together well. Uh, it's, it's almost like a basket, um, a woven basket that's come undone. And you know, you can kind of start picking pieces out and it gets weaker and weaker uh, and it just can't go back to the shape or the functionality it once has. So decorin uh, and being able to stimulate that, which quite a few newer anti-aging peptides can do, uh, that is an interesting way to look at stopping uh, existing wrinkles from becoming deeper etched lines. Where are we timing wise? We're about 25 minutes in. I wanna make sure I got this educational. We talked about um, dynamic lines is another name for expression lines. Um, and then the sun damage type lines are typically called fixed lines or static lines. Um, expression lines tend to become more apparent when you are being expressive. And then when your face is at rest, you don't notice those lines as much. Over time, you will, depending on how expressive you are. You know, we all people. Who, some people have forehead lines um, that, even when their face is at rest, you can just tell exactly where they are. Um, I uh, I'm not one of those people that gets those deep lines on the forehead. I'm not quite sure why. It's not that I don't have an expressive forehead, uh, and I haven't had Botox done in forever. So, uh, but that is a very very popular area to inject with Botox because a lot of people don't like that. You know, that furrowed brow. They want that area to look smooth. Um, and then there's the also what's known as wrinkle folds. And that type of wrinkle, that's what I was talking about um, earlier in the show, uh, where the nasolabial folds, you start getting more pronounced, more etched lines here. And then through this area, you can get what's called marionette lines, as in like a puppet. Um, Fillers can help with that a lot. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend Botox um, right so close to the mouth uh, unless you are going to see somebody who's incredibly experienced with it and including injecting it around the mouth. Um, the obvious issue being uh, an inability to close your mouth, um, sitting around drooling all the time, uh, and potentially um, uh, an, a lost ability to chew. Uh, which, you know, nobody wants to go on a liquid diet for months and months while the Botox wears off. Okay, I think I got all the education aspect out of the way. For certain, summing that up, the number one thing you can do, say it with me, sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. Every day, broad spectrum, SPF 30 or greater, the sooner you start applying it, the sooner you will see uh, your skin maintain a youthful look, a healthier look. You'll be offsetting a huge portion of damage that will become visible later in life in the form of wrinkles. So let's see what's on your mind. Let's get to these questions here. Looks like they've been piling up nicely. Okay, Kelsey, let's start off with Miss Kelsey N. Can I mix two mineral only sunscreens together to get a lighter tint? Yes, you can. Is it okay to use a water resistant sunscreen every day? Was a second question from Kelsey. If you feel you need to, um, there, there's nothing, the ingredients that make a sunscreen uh, water resistant are typically film forming agents, uh, sometimes even certain silicones, and, and they stay on the surface of skin. So um, if you notice that using a waterproof sunscreen versus a non-waterproof sun or water resistant, waterproof isn't allowed anymore. That term is because it's not true. No sunscreens waterproof, water resistant, bad word. Uh, water resistant sunscreens, if you notice compared to a non-water resistant that you seem to have better luck with clogged pores when you wear the non-water resistant one, that could be a sign. But if you're not seeing any negative effects from it, there's no harm to your skin uh, in doing that and wearing one every day. And then in terms of mixing two mineral sunscreens, the only thing you have to keep in mind is that you, you are uh, probably in a small way, but you are impacting the level of protection you're getting. You don't know how much, chances are you're not weakening it. But for example, if you're mixing an SPF 30 mineral with an SPF 15 mineral, I would default to thinking you're only getting the SPF protection of the lower of the two. You're not getting SPF 45. Um, and without testing, it's difficult to say how much you're getting. 
um, which is why I, if somebody feels the need to mix sunscreens, I generally advise them just to make sure that they both have the same SPF rating. So you're not weakening the protection, you know, potentially having it. There we go. Linda, hi from sunny and hot Arizona. 104, 104 today. Oh my gosh. We've been a bit on the chilly side here. I don't know if I do on 104 though, but I've been in Arizona in the summer. Um, years ago when I worked for Aveda, they had a massive um, conference there. Uh, it was in Phoenix in mid-June um, and we were dying. I had never experienced that type of heat before, and now I have many more times, and I'm like, okay, I know what to expect. But you've got all these people milling around outside because they held it outdoors, and it was it was retail folks and salon folks, and we all had to dress in black from head to toe. People were passing out. We were in these covered tents for presentations in the blazing sun and the heat. You know, that you were out of the sun, but the heat from it was definitely coming in uh, through the through the plastic of the tent and people were passing out in their seats it was it was I don't know if they ever went back to Phoenix in June to do that um, or if they just moved the event inside so actually they did move most of the other activities inside in the resort where it was air conditioned because everyone was complaining um, and again we had people there from all over the country so it wasn't just native Arizonans who were like what are you complaining about this is how it always is um, Valerie, oh no, Andrea, forgot about Andrea. Andrea says, I'm about to start using retinol and peptides for first time. Any real hope they can at least soften the look of the deep horizontal creases on this 66 year old forehead? Can anything, anything short of Botox, fillers, etc. So for the deeper horizontal creases on the forehead, I'm, I'm just straight out, Botox or Dysport is your best bet. That is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. However, because um, at, at your age and if you know, with accumulated sun damage, you're also likely dealing with skin texture changes. So regular use of an AHA or BHA leave-on exfoliant, of course sunscreen. Uh, retinol can absolutely help. Retinol is probably the alpha and omega of anti-wrinkle ingredients beyond sunscreen. Like that's that they should go hand in hand. Not everyone can use retinol. I would encourage you to experiment with different strengths and, and uh, formats of it to find your retinol. You know, what's your sweet spot? Um, if you can't use retinol, though, I, and I know I've said this before, but there are other anti-wrinkle firming ingredients out there. Uh, absolutely. It's not, you will not be aging in the cold if you can't use retinol. But I'd be remiss in not saying that it is kind of the granddaddy of anti-wrinkle ingredients including in prescription form, tretinoin, um, tazerotene even, even to some extent different, which is adapalene. All of those prescription retinoids can play a role in that, but tretinoin by far uh, the brand name for, I don't even know if this is still out there because <clears throat> it's now available generically, but for years the brand name was Renova, which is the Johnson & Johnson tretinoin, which was the cosmetic for wrinkles version of Retin-A years and years ago. Um, but that's a classic ingredient that worked then and it works now. So, um, yes, I, Andrea, I do think that there is hope for skincare, but it's definitely for those types of lines, particularly if you're not using great skincare in conjunction with an injectable, you're still going to be moving your forehead. You know, it's, it's just, it's just the truth. And, um, so if you're if you're not ready for Botox or if it's not within your budget, whatever the reason is, it doesn't hurt by the way. Um, and I'm a needle phobe. Um, if it's not within your budget, or again for for whatever reason you're you're hesitant to try Botox or Dysport, which is an alternative as well. Um, hyaluronic acid fillers aren't typically used for those lines. Um, I do think that a peptide retinol combination, sunscreen, a leave-on exfoliant can really help uh, improve that. You could also experiment with some of the wrinkle filler-like products out there. Um, one of the first ones that comes to mind would be the um, serum uh, or the line filler type product from Estee Lauder's uh, Perfectionist line. And that 
products like that typically use silicone elastomers, which are have a temporary filling effect uh, on, on skin. Um, and how long the effect lasts depends on how expressive you are. Um, but it's worth trying to see. And, and what, what I would do in terms of working a product like that in is have it be the second to last product you apply um, and then put your sunscreen on top. Or it can be the last skincare product you apply if the foundation, assuming you wear a foundation or a tinted moisturizer, for example, if that contains sunscreen, as long as you're applying that liberally and evenly, that can be your facial sunscreen. So give that a go and let, and let me know, you know, come back. I know you're typically with us on these chats, so come back and let me know if you found something that you really like. Valerie says, Brian, could you one day demonstrate how to apply the vitamin C25 booster? Sure. I tend to use that product um, as a spot treatment and I, I don't, I'm not going to actually have some in my bathroom right now, but I'm not going to leave you hanging and run and get it. But um, it's, it, that is a great example of a product that has that thick, almost spackle like cream texture that I was talking about to Andrea. Um, but you can find that, that type of texture in a formula that's more designed for the purpose of filling in and smoothing wrinkles and then also offers your skin some interesting other ingredients. So with the C25, I typically just dispense a pea-sized dot on my fingertip and then I put it where I need that little bit of extra help. Uh, and I, I have used it in the past around my eyes. I think it has a nice effect there. I just kind of tap it. Um, you don't want to rub it. You don't want to rub it too much. That can uh, cause it to interact with other products uh, and potentially lead to some rolling or pilling. So I just kind of like dabbing that on. Um, but it has a really nice non-aqueous texture. Okay, who else, who else, who else? Uh, Chelsea, I started retinol for the first time last week and was wondering when you'd recommend I start using other actives again. Um, you can, I think a week is, is a nice amount of time to get a sense of how the retinol, how your skin is acclimating to the retinol. Um, so when you want to start weaving in products with other active ingredients, my general recommendation, um, a lot of people can just apply, can just layer, just, you know, and layer several bioactive products without incident. But if you want to take it slow, my suggestion would be to weave in that, weave in those other bioactive products one at a time and then apply the pro that new product um, at a separate time of day from your retinol. So if you're usually using your retinol product at night and you're thinking, I want to get this vitamin C product or whatever it is back in my routine, that can go on in the morning. And then if that seems to be working well after another week or so, and you're thinking, you know, I just, I don't want to apply this many products during the day. I got to get to work. I got to, you know, it's, I want to keep my daytime routine simpler, but I love indulging in skincare at night. You can try experimenting and layering at night. And then you layer um, based on product texture with the thinnest of the treatment products going on first, followed by the next thickest. If they all have the same type of texture, then the guideline is go with what feels best to you. You need to experiment. How, how does layering the C and the retinol and the niacinamide feel versus niacinamide first, retinol, and then the C? That's, that's up to you, and, and there's no right or wrong there. It's just whatever feels good uh, and works with the rest of your routine. Rebecca asks, any new products coming up for lines and wrinkles specifically like the Retired Skin Firming Line Minimizer? We are always looking at various um, uh, permutations of anti-aging products. I, I would encourage you to, if you haven't checked it out yet, particularly if you have drier skin, I think our CBD oil with half percent retinol is a fascinating formula. Um, really, really ingenious blend of some very um, nourishing antioxidant, beneficial fatty acid rich oils, including hemp seed oil, lupine oil, radish seed oil, uh, and then of course you're getting um, the benefit of the 150 milligrams of CBD, that's per bottle, not per use, uh, and CBD is just such a great anti-inflammatory for skin. Your skin has receptors for CBD that it can connect to and then send that message to the cells saying, hey, calm down, let's, you know, we're getting a little excited here, let's not do that anymore. And 
we love the idea of the synergy of what CBD does from an anti-inflammatory side and what retinol does at half percent from an anti-aging side. So I think out of our most recent launches uh, for wrinkles, I think that is incredibly impressive. And I'm also a huge fan of our, uh, um, I use the CBD oil every now and then. It's a little bit too much for me to use all the time. Uh, and not necessarily because of the oil, but because of um, half percent retinol. Um, my skin is just weird about retinol. Um, for example, I can use our retinol booster, which is 1%, two or three times a week without an issue. If I try to use it much more than that, I start getting a kickback uh, from retinol irritation, which is never the goal. Uh, and it's one of those kickbacks that I just can't get past. The only way I can get past it is to reduce frequency of application. Um, I've tried being patient. It just doesn't work. But the clinical 2% um, Bakuchiol and 0.3% retinol, we have this whole like retinol step-up range now, which is actually really cool. That's kind of was a hole in our product assortment for quite some time. You had to go, your choice was a very low but still effective dose of retinol or a very high <laughs> dose of retinol, and there was really no in-between. Um, now there is. So I've been able to use that new Bakuchiol Retinol Combo product, which is in our clinical line, every night. Every night. No problems. I'm loving the results. Uh, I would say that right now, that is the main anti-wrinkle product in my daily routine outside of sunscreen. So I think it's fantastic. And if you, if the oil texture of the CBD retinol oil just sounds too rich for your skin type, um, try that, try the clinical product. Stephanie, is there a benefit in wearing a silicone mask over my retinol treatment at night? Um, yeah, I mean, I, depending on the formula, um, what a lot of silicones, some silicones are inherently hydrating, like dimethicone. Some silicones aren't necessarily hydrating. They're not drying, but what they can do is they form a flexible, breathable mesh on skin surface that can feel very comfortable um, and can help uh, seal in uh, those bioactive ingredients and potentially let them work a little longer before they start breaking down. Um, so I don't, as long, assuming it's a well-formulated product, not something that, you know, and I, I hate to throw spa products under the bus, but there's so many bad spa products out there that are just laden with fragrance. Uh, as long as it's not a product like that, that's just perfume city, uh, preferably fra fragrance free, but you know, if it's got a little bit of fragrance in it, I'm not gonna tell on you. I just don't want you using super fragrant products, especially every single day, because it's just not good for your skin. All right, where did we leave off? Little Miss Shart, Little Miss Chatterbox. Hi, Brian, I don't have any fine lines or wrinkles except when I smile. Then I have a few around my eyes. Would any product or Botox help with this? I think if you're using, um, uh, yeah, for, for skincare wise, yes. Um, a, a great antioxidant serum, like any of the ones that we sell, any of the ones the Beautypedia team recommends, uh, along with daily application of sunscreen could be wonderful. Um, the antioxidants really go a long way to um, help skin to repair itself. They can thwart damaging enzymes that get generated in skin as a result of environmental exposure. Some antioxidants and some peptides can even stop what uh, the overproduction of um, a process that occurs in skin called glycation. Um, and if you think gly glycation is is uh, is a what do you call it, a physics phenomenon? Um, no, probably more accurate to call it a chemistry phenomenon. But think about what happens when you take raw dough. Let's say you're making chocolate chip cookies. And you put, you know, you put the little dough balls on the cookie sheet, evenly spaced, put it in the oven for 12, 15 minutes, whatever. And then voila, the dough transforms into a nice golden brown, yummy chocolate chip cookie. Well, that process of the raw dough going from its raw state to a cooked state and turning that golden brown, that's a form of glycation. So is baking bread. But that, that glycation uh, where too many rogue sh sugar molecules accumulate in skin, they generate enzymes that then 
um, latch on to uh, collagen, the type of collagen, collagen one, uh, and start chipping away at it. They basically just kind of start beating it up. Uh, and the collagen uh, can only take so much of that before it really starts uh, becoming depleted. Uh, so the more you can do topically to minimize that glycation uh, from happening, and there's also things you can do via dietary choices. Uh, I, in the, the general guideline, uh, it's actually quite simple. Eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, which are antioxidant rich, uh, and avoid highly processed foods particularly um, baked goods that are, you know, high sugar, high white flour. I know, I know, don't shoot the messenger. I love my cupcakes too. I love my carrot cake. Um, and I know we have to live and enjoy life, so I'm not saying never do that. But the more you can minimize that, especially as you age, uh, the better. That's just, that's just the fact straight from the research, um, you know, from me to you. So... Okay, Jobs to Jillian. We'll get to Jillian. Jerry, hi, Brian. Over the years, I've noticed a lot more advanced and complicated formulas that seem to irritate my skin, but certain skin types just not tolerate many actives well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're, 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 it's a complicated, um, it can be a, a complicated answer because there, there could be numerous things going on that, that, is, that is impacting that. It could be uh, some degree of formulary incompatibility, and by that I don't mean you can't use niacinamide with vitamin C. Um, it's that's what I mean by that is it could be that maybe the emulsifier system in one product isn't playing well with the emulsifier system in another. Maybe the preservative, uh, the the total preservative load. Um, second to fragrance, preservatives are um, are the most common. Excuse me skin sensitizer cited in the research. Uh, however, you can't credibly offer water-based cosmetic products without some sort of preservation system because th this is a great example of the fact that there are trade-offs in life and in skincare. Um, without a robust preservative system, that water-based product would have a very short shelf life. It would be highly prone to contamination. Uh, from our fingers, from light and air exposure, from bacteria that gets into the product through numerous, uh, numerous ways, uh, and that product could quickly become pathogenic and unsafe, uh, unhealthy actually for you to use, and we don't want that. So the balancing act with preservatives is to create and use a preservative system that gives you that microbial fungal control that you want with the least impact to skin. And most skincare, I think, does a pretty good job of balancing that out because we know a lot about how to combine different preservatives and at what amount to use them at, where you're going to get that efficacy, but you're not going to tip the scales to make them irritating. But what those, <coughs> what those um, computations don't account for is what happens when a large population of people are using several products um, that have not only bioactive ingredients, but all of them have some sort of preservative system. And what about those individual reactions when all of those preservative systems are layered on top of each other? I'm speculating, but I'm th that could be something that's going on, particularly if you find that your skin can tolerate one or two bioactive products at a time, but not when you try to apply them all at once. Um, there is also the component that some people's skin just can't handle all of those bioactive ingredients at the same time. Uh, much like your digestive system can't handle a very big meal, at least not all the time. Uh, so we, you know, parse out how much we eat in a given sitting. Um, the name of the game here, though, is just experimentation. Um, I don't, I, I have a lot of anti-aging bioactive products in my routine, you know, that I, I weave in and out. I've talked about this before. I've got my booster wardrobe. I don't apply, uh, I have my core products I use morning and night, but in terms of the treatments, I, I tend to rotate those in and out, except for the clinical one I just mentioned. That's because I really like the benefits of using retinol every day, once day. Um, and this just seems to be my sweet spot in terms of the right strength of retinol for me to use daily. Um, and I, I know that Bakuchiol is helping as well. 
I think we're going to find out some pretty cool stuff about Bacuchiol, which is a plant-derived ingredient, as more research unfolds about that. All right, we're down to about 10 minutes. Jillian says, hi from New Zealand. Can I use the peptide booster, cut off there, with vitamin C or retinol? Yes, you can. There are peptides, um, far fewer than there used to be, but there are some types of peptides that um, can be a bit tricky to use with um, acids. Um, the acids tend to cause the peptides to more readily break down. Um, I think that's, again, I think that's fewer and farther between. We make sure all of the peptides that we use in our formulas, including the peptide booster, are skin compatible. Uh, meaning that they're formulated to work within the pH of normal healthy skin, which is on the acidic side, typically around 4.5 to 5, depending on the research you're looking at, um, and that the peptides are those that either are engineered to have a special uh, delivery system so they can reach their target cells, or we take extra steps to make sure that the base formula can carry that peptide to where it needs to be in skin before it breaks down. One of the earlier issues with um, a lot of the first generation peptide products is that enzymes in skin uh, readily broke them down. They, you know, peptides are small molecules, you know, the building blocks of protein, but an individual peptide isn't necessarily all that big. I think we, we've got bigger ones now, but the first generation peptides were a bit more simplistic, like palmitoyl uh, pentapeptide or tri pal palmitoyl tripeptide 3. Um, that was one of the first that used fatty acid technology to overcome that obstacle that um, a lot of the first generation peptides had where, yes, they were in the product, yes, they could make that label claim, but when you put it on the skin, it really wasn't doing much. That's why in the earlier days when we were looking at peptides and writing about them, uh, we opted to say that the benefit, while interesting, at this point is likely more theory than fact. We just didn't have enough concrete information to support that, yes, those peptides really can do beneficial things for skin. Uh, and even today, it's still about, can they get to their target area in skin to exert the effect that they are designed to do? And we take every step to make sure that that happens. Uh, all right. Oh, well, Michelle says, happy anniversary. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, for those of you who may be unaware, earlier this month, I hit my 20-year mark with Paula's Choice. I Never thought I'd have any job as an adult that long, uh, let alone a, a job that turned into a career, but here we are. Uh, and it's been a great ride. It still is. Uh, do, 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 do. Paulista, in the evening I use the peptide booster, which I mix with the Resist 0.1% retinol serum, uh, and it works very well. Will the new 0.3 clinical retinol alone replace this pair? Will I miss an effect? So the, the clinical has, um, I believe, three three different peptides in there that we chose in part because they have somewhat of the same types of benefits as retinol uh, in regards to collagen stimulation and collagen repair. So would you be missing something by just using the Bacuchiol retinol product with some peptides and not using the peptide booster? You'd be missing the unique peptides in that peptide booster along with um, many of the supporting ingredients, including several amino acids. So um, I don't think, I wouldn't go so far as to say, oh, you're cheating your skin by not doing that. But yeah, to answer the question, are you missing something with that combination? You would be. You wouldn't be getting, uh, you're, you wouldn't be getting the same mix of peptides that you're getting now. Um, so if it works within your skincare budget, um, and you can do both, great. I think you'll see compounded uh, positive results from doing so. But if it's, a, if it's a one or the other type choice and you're really keen on retinol, then go with the clinical. All right, Let's see if I can get a few more in here before the clock stops. Not like it's literally going to stop, but. Uh, Anna, hi, I use a 2% BHA lotion in my routine now, switched from the liquid, but now I'm a bit confused as to where to put my hyaluronic acid serum since the lotion is thicker than the serum. Good point. The, our, our advice is that in, in terms of order of application, doing your cleanser, if you use your toner, that goes on next, then the leave-on exfoliant. The 
hyaluronic acid serum uh, can still get through that 2% BHA lotion. It's going to be impeded a bit because of the base, but everything will still get to where it needs to go. It's all about the molecular size of the ingredient. Um, and if you think about it, what's stopping, uh, or what not what's stopping, what's slowing the penetration of some of those water-based ingredients are like the fatty alcohols and the more emollient ingredients in the 2% BHA lotion. But everybody, even those with dry skin, that just don't have as much of it, but everybody has a mix of fatty acids uh, like you know, ceramides, cholesterol, and of course our skin's own sebum. If you're, you know, it, yet skincare ingredients uh, can get to where they need to go in skin, even with the presence of all of those substances that um, are designed to one degree or another to um, help protect skin. Uh, but in what those ingredients in the skincare products can do, depending on their solubility, uh, there's water soluble and oil soluble, and then there's things you can do to the water soluble ingredients to help them um, uh, penetrate past where they would normally go. Um, and formulators, at least the ones that we work with, take those um, physiologic uh, issues into a, into account, and that that is why skincare uh, products you can apply several of them at once, and they all still work. The ones that are applied, applying a gel product over a thicker lotion, um, again, it's going to slow the penetration somewhat, but everything will eventually get to where it needs to go. You don't need to worry about that. However, you could also experiment. Maybe this will work better for you. And, and in lieu of the exfoliant step, put your booster on and then put your exfoliant on top. You could try that and see how it works. I suspect you'll prefer it the other way, but let me know. Derek, hi Brian Hayes, your hair looks fabulous. Thank you. Are there any topical solutions for lines that develop on the neck? Um, I appreciate the compliment on my hair because like a lot of us, um, we haven't been able to get to the salon. We've been using box color. Um, I know, type, what a thing to complain about with everything else that's going on. Um, but I am very fortunate that I was able to, I got in to get a haircut and this was just good timing on my part um, before the state shut down salons. I had a feeling that was coming and I was like, oh, I'm going in for a haircut. Um, so lines on the neck, which typically tend to be horizontal. It's not very often you see vertical lines on the neck. It can happen with extensive sun damage uh, to people who are uh, typically 70s, 80s, 90s, and even older. Um, you don't need a special neck cream. Uh, I always make sure, um, you know, if you're looking at my neck now at, and I'm 46 and you're like, you know, wow, that, that neck looks pretty damn good. Uh, I haven't had any work done on it, but what I have done for 20 plus years uh, is make sure that I put sunscreen on my neck every day, every day. Um, I don't want to be one of those people whose neck looks older than my face. I kind of want them to age in tandem. Um, so sunscreen is just, it's incredibly important. It is surprising how many people uh, miss that area, or maybe they don't think your neck is as exposed and a anatomically it isn't. You've got this structure over it. So like sun overhead, you know, no one gets a sunburn just standing outside, you know, because of this, the shelf effect that the jaw creates as it juts out over the neck. But, you know, you've got the sides of the neck to worry about. So in terms of lines, the same types of anti-aging ingredients that work on the face will work on the neck and should also be applied there as well, up to and including sunscreen. You can talk to a cosmetic dermatologist about um, some, some cosmetic dermatologists will do uh, various types of um, line smoothing fillers in the neck. They, this is newer generation and it's uh, typically hyaluronic acid that has a very different texture than the type of hyaluronic acid that would be injected say like around the eyes or in the nasolabial folds. That type of hyaluronic acid uh, filler tends to be more thicker, like a thick viscous gel uh, that they inject and then kind of have to you know finagle into place and then it spreads out and sets. Um, so it would be worth having a discussion 
uh, with a cosmetic dermatologist if that is something that you're concerned about. But I think between sun protection, using an AHA or BHA exfoliant on the neck, yes, 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 that too, and anything anti-aging that you use on your face, take it down to your neck. And I think you'll start seeing a difference pretty soon. All right, we're just at the end of the hour, but who haven't we taken a question to? Oh, is it because... Uh, da, 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 who have we taken a question from? Anything, any, let's do one more about wrinkles. Uh, oh, Paulista, thank you for the feedback. Uh, MDW, can I or should I use the new 20% niacinamide as a booster and mix it with a serum or should I stick with layering? Uh, does it matter if the clinical niacinamide is mixed with another product or not? No, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. I I like applying. I I do that product in the morning. Um, I like applying it neat. Uh, so I'll I'll do I'll cleanse. I'll I'll shave and then do my my toner. Um, and then I'll put on the niacinamide treatment. If my skin is feeling a little on the dry side, I may follow with the water infusing electrolyte moisturizer. That's what's in my rotation now. Um, and then sunscreen on top of that and that's my my simple ish morning <laughs> morning routine but yes it's fine to apply it by itself it's fine to mix a few drops in with another product um and which one that is it, it is dealer's choice as long as it isn't your sunscreen because you never want to mix anything in with the sunscreen that will dilute it the exception being another sunscreen that preferably has the same spf rating which we mentioned at the top of the show so that's it for this episode, all about fine lines and wrinkles. And once again, thank you guys for your fantastic questions. Um, you know, I, I learned just as much from you as far as what's on your mind and what you're doing and what's working and what's not working. So I really appreciate all of the questions and the feedback. Um, keep it coming. Uh, I will come back to, uh, to this video over the next few days, see if you have any follow-up questions that you want to post in the comments section and otherwise. I'll be back with a new topic in a couple of weeks. Take care of yourselves so you can take care of others. Be well.